So my research interest um, is quite a straightforward one. Basically, how does all human spontaneous thought happen? Um, it's not that easy to get a handle on, but this uh, Virginia Woolf quote does it quite well. And it's from To the Lighthouse. And her protagonist here is basically just disengaging from the immediate external world. And then it's mentioning that things start cropping up in her mind. So things like scenes, names, sayings, memories, and ideas. And we're all familiar with this feeling of having spontaneous thoughts that feel like they're coming from nowhere. So that's my research interest. And as a cognitive neuroscientist, I'm interested in the uh, network that represents these types of thought. Uh, this is known as the default mode network, and it's this cluster of different brain regions. And what's happening here is that they're actually um, acting as a scaffold for all of these seemingly random thoughts that are being fed in from different brain regions and helping us provide some sort of clear narrative, so an idea, a creative piece of thought, or a plan for the future. Now, the default mode network has to be very careful with its balance, how it's talking to different brain regions, because if this becomes wrong, you get a faulty neural network, and you have things such as anxiety disorders from a faulty neural network. In this example, um, when people have anxiety, the default mode network is talking too much to brain regions specialized for threat detection, and that means that their spontaneous thought isn't doing all those positive things I mentioned a minute ago. It's generally doing negative emotional rumination. Now, what we want to do is effectively break the default mode network out of this uh, wall that is created by just talking to this one network too much, and we're going to force it to talk to other networks by making individuals do a cognitive task when uh, they're feeling more negatively emotional. So the way we do this is uh, we have developed a thing called experience sampling, and we just get individuals to sort of do some sort of task that distracts them for a while, and every so often we have a thought probe. We've got an example of four, four thought probes there. And we just interrupt them, and we ask them what they're thinking through a series of questions that aren't that transparent. And what we found is we can actually track things like emotional thought throughout time. So this is one of our individuals um, from one of our studies who actually had a higher amount of anxiety. As you can see there, uh, the thoughts start off quite neutral for a while. You know, they're negative, and then they raise to positive again. Now, what we want to do is we want to take this sampling, and we want to put it into people's smartphones. So instead of having it in a lab, it's on a smartphone now. And they're just doing everyday tasks, and every so often they've got a notification, and they, ask, and they answer a simple set of about seven or eight different questions. It takes less than a minute. Uh, and in anxious individuals, what we're going to do then is when their um, negative emotional feelings are ramped up, we're going to interrupt them and ask them to play an immersive cognitive game. And this breaks the default mode network out of that um, ruminative thought, and it makes it connect with other networks that are doing other things cognitively. Uh, this has been used to treat um, post-traumatic stress recently, so we know it works at uh, disrupting emotional thought. And so this is uh, really unique. No one's tried it. No one's tried to put it actually in people's phones and actually do interventionist treatment through that. Although recently, uh, other sort of psychiatrists and health pr professionals have seen that there is an application for this with smartphone technology as well as medication. Thank you. Great, thank you. Can I just clarify, so it's the interruption itself that breaks the cycle of the negative room. That's the plan, yeah. And any interruption would do? A game or the question? It needs to be immersive, so it's the game. So sorry, uh, I should say, there's actually, the benefits of this are twofold. So the questions are really useful because they actually sample in real time the emotions. So if you imagine being a practitioner, if the patient agrees, you can actually track how they've been doing before you see them. So that's one benefit. But the second part is spotting... Um, at points where the rumination is happening, so cycles of the negative thought happening very frequently in between the thought probes. At that point, you hit them with the thing that is a game. And it's something like Tetris works quite well because it's really immersive. Uh, studies have shown in the past that just three minutes is actually enough to sort of disrupt that emotional network that the brain's trying to talk to because, you know, Tetris has got nothing really directly to do with those networks. And can I just ask, sorry, I'm going to cheat, a quick supplementary <laughs> question. You can count it as one. So you think it's hitting the same sort of mechanisms that the cognitive behavioral therapies in this area do? Um, it's, 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 I'd say it's related, but it's not directly the same. I wouldn't say it's exactly part of the same thing. Um, I know cognitive behavioral therapy sort of, it's, the, the onus is still a lot on the patient. Um, to actually bring back those methods. This sort of takes it out of their hands and actually provides the distraction, if you will. So I'd say it's actually possibly a level easier. Um, but it could actually be integrated with cognitive behavioral theory uh, just from the, from the point of the thought probe of knowing when the rumination is happening. Um, talking about um, CBT and uh, the way your research can play into that, um, it's interesting to me... Um, I imagine this would work very well on mild to moderate cases of anxiety, but for more severe cases, um, have you had any evidence of any um, results from that? And would you say it's more of 
uh, an extra step for, the, for those kind of cases rather than um, a replacement of, say, things like CBT? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're trying to actually currently set up a clinical link up with some people at Sussex who have um, clinically diagnosed uh, anxious individuals to test this on. Uh, we agree, I agree with you that actually it, the low to mid-level right now is where this would t probably work the best. But actually, when you look at the health statistics out of the last few years, there's a significant trend of those being the more prevalent cases. So we actually think it might be a good interventionist point to come in at and potentially stop, uh, say, rumination becoming a habit in these people if you can disrupt it at the right times. But it's a good question, and we will try to expand into a clinical population. Sorry, some question over there. Thank you. That's a really interesting idea. Um, so if it, if it works, then it should be treated as a sort of a standard medical intervention. But obviously, uh, I wonder if there's a social side. Uh, I can imagine if I was a, um, an employer and suddenly my employees were uh, being requested to play Tetris on a regular basis, I might start to get somewhat yeah. annoyed. So I was wondering if you thought there were going to be complications. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, the way employers treat you right now, I think they'd be much happier that someone else is taking care of the problem and just <laughs> let them answer the phone. Um, but to be honest, um, the frequency of the samples um, would be set to be slightly higher than is you know, actually needed without being intrusive. So they could effectively ignore them at the right times. And plus, when they're actually engaged in a task, anxious individuals can be sort of ignoring those emotional feelings because you know, they're busy. So if they're busy, it's kind of fine. We're really trying to target those uh, periods of free thought that usually are used for useful constructive thought and stop them being dominated by the negative ruminative thought. Maladin, thank you. Thanks.